Imagine the unimaginable. What if you woke up to find your 12-year-old daughter lying stabbed to death on her bedroom floor? And what if the local police destroyed your home, looking for evidence to pin the murder on your innocent son? The real-life family who lived that nightmare. Next. Hello, history lovers, and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. Now number one in podcasting, thanks to loyal listeners like you. In this episode, our time machine travels back to 1998 to bear horrified witness to a travesty of justice that could never be fully made right. One winter morning in that year, the small town of Escondido, California, awoke to the terrible news that their 12-year-old neighbor, Stephanie Crow, had been brutally savaged by a knife-wielding killer. Worse, the killer appeared to have gotten away scot-free. Well, police don't like unsolved homicides, do they? So the police in Escondido immediately profiled the men in the house. Sure, it had to be a father, stepfather, or brother. Soon enough, they zeroed in on Stephanie's 14-year-old brother, Michael. Putting the verdict first and trial afterwards, like the Queen of Hearts in Alice in Wonderland, investigators launched an inquisition to prove their conclusion, rather than following the evidence and clues wherever they led. Walking us through this dark lesson in law and order gone mad is Donald E. McGinnis, a criminal defense attorney who represented one of the persecuted boys, Aaron Hauser. In that role, he applied his experience as a deputy district attorney prosecuting cases for Contra Costa and Santa Clara counties, allowing him to identify the flaws in procedure and violation of civil rights that threatened to destroy three more young lives along with Stephanie's. To say nothing of the devastation it wrought on a family that should have been grieving their daughter's death. This true crime book is called She's So Cold, Murder, Accusations, and the System that Devastated a Family. And it's a reminder that great injustices aren't just the stuff of some distant historic past of lynch mobs and show trials and the Salem witches. It's a very real threat in any system run by flawed human beings who have biases and are going to make mistakes. You can find our guest online at donaldmcginnis.com or like the Hamilton and McGinnis page on Facebook. That last name is spelled M-C-I-N-N-I-S. Okay. Now that we've arrived at the crime scene, let's join Donald E. McGinnis and experience the tale of justice denied in She's So Cold. I'm joined on the line by Donald E. McGinnis, author of She's So Cold, Murder, Accusations, and the System that Devastated a Family. Thank you so much for making time to talk with the History Author Show. Well, thank you for calling. Well, gosh, this is one of those books that compelled me to speak to the author, compelled me to do what I could to tell people about She's So Cold, because it does what good history does. It teaches us something from the past and gives us a way forward. It helps us live our lives in a better way and make the whole flawed human system a little bit better here in the U.S. in this case. I'd like you to start by describing that opening scene 
where we get your title, She's So Cold, where those words are spoken when they discover the body. In my head, I heard the Rolling Stones there, She's So Cold. It's something you sometimes say about a person in a metaphorical sense, whereas here with young Stephanie Crow, it's sadly quite literal. There she is found cold and dead on her bedroom floor. So give us that scene and tell us how you chose that for the title for your book. Well, the uh, the grandmother was staying with the Crow family. Stephanie has an older brother, Michael, and Shannon, a younger sister. The grandma was staying in the uh, bedroom uh, with uh, Shannon, and she heard an alarm go off, and it was the alarm for Stephanie to go to school. And so she got up because the alarm was not being turned off. It was ringing over and over and over again. So she put on her robe, walked down the hallway, and uh, walked into the room and pushed open the door. She turned the light on, and there, there she saw Stephanie. And she could not believe what she saw. And she screamed out loud for Stephen, the father, and for Cheryl, the mother. The father was the first one down to where the grandmother was, he saw his daughter, he picked her up, realized that she was in serious condition, not knowing that she was dead. And he ran, uh, looking through the house to see if the, the person that did this was still around, opening up several doors. By then, Cheryl was there, and she saw her daughter, and she reached down and picked up her daughter uh, from a kneeling position with the child laying prone on the floor. And she said, oh, she is so cold, Ma. She's so cold, talking to the grandmother. And she kept clutching the child against her, saying, I'll warm her up. In fact, the paramedics had to pry her loose from her child. She continually tried to warm the child, bring her back to life. It was a very sad, very sad scene. And that is the opening scene of the book. And the reason that the book is called She's So Cold I wanted the reader to understand the agony that a mother goes through when she finds her child there on the floor dead. And so as as you read through the book, you'll see the name She So Cold come up, and it brings back the horror that Stephen and Cheryl Crow went through with that daughter stabbed to death, covered in blood. As you said that, they couldn't believe what they were seeing. I thought to myself exactly that, that for the rest of their lives, they'll never be able to stop seeing what they saw that morning. It's something that you never get over, and that becomes clear in the book. Then they have to go through this whole other ordeal. This is not just the story of somebody that was murdered 20 years ago. 20 years ago usually wouldn't quite be history to me, although it is, and she's so cold really was compelling because it does do what good history does. It it teaches, it does all of those things. But also, I wanted to play a small part in spreading the cautionary tale of the Crow family's ordeal. You can't imagine that at this moment you're describing where they find their daughter dead on the floor in a pool of her own blood, that the horror is just beginning for them. They're not even able to just plan a funeral. They're not able to heal. They're not even able to go back to their own house. Their house doesn't exist. They, they lose their house due to the police tearing it apart just as they've lost their daughter. They lose their son. Their son's thrown him in prison and they can't get to him. And that ordeal is something that as a person who gets very passionate about justice and I never shrug my shoulders to it, I don't know what it is about me. I'm not saying I'm a particularly special person. Maybe it's because I was picked on a lot when I was young and <laughs> I don't like to see people get picked on. I don't know what it is, but without getting into my own psychology, because psychology will come up plenty here as we talk about your book, it really does read like something out of Franz Kafka's The Trial. In that case, a man on trial, he doesn't know why he's there. He doesn't know why he's been arrested, why he's been put on trial. Nobody tells him. Or there's a great Twilight Zone with Burgess Meredith where they make you an unperson. The Obsolete Man is the name of the episode of The Twilight Zone. And all of those things, a prosecution and a dictatorship, you would say, okay, this makes sense. They don't know what the heck they're doing. We condescend to them maybe from our perch here in the U.S. We trust our justice system. So it's incredible to see whether it's something like Stephanie Crow's murder in She's So Cold or 9-11 or the Challenger exploding. So many little things have to go wrong that 
you wouldn't believe it if you wrote it in a novel. You wouldn't think that it could have gotten through so many cracks in this system. How could so many things have gone wrong? How did it happen? How could it happen? It all starts with the police not wanting to fail, not being able to solve the murder. They can't have a murder that's unsolved. They can't have a case that is unsolved. And as a consequence, the police become trapped into their own system of investigation, but more importantly, into their own system of interrogation. The American system of interrogation is an accusatory interrogation. It is one where the suspect that they are talking to, or the person of interest that they are talking to, is assumed to be guilty. And therefore, they use what is called the Reed technique of interrogation. And that entire system is built upon not gathering information, but intimidating the uh, witness and getting them to agree to their theme, their version of what happened. And as a consequence, one step after another, one shoe after another fell, and they got deeper and deeper and deeper into this cycle that not only destroyed the house, they tore the walls, the floorboards, Everything was destroyed inside that house as they looked for the murder weapon, as they looked for evidence. But it also ended up with them taking a 14-year-old boy traumatized by the death of his sister, by seeing his grandmother, his father, and his mother totally destroyed by the loss of their daughter, and beat him up to the point where they convince him that he has two persons. He is an evil and a good Michael. And then from there, they extract the so-called written confession. But it's all part of the Reed technique of interrogation, which is one that is very accusatory. It is close-ended questions. Isn't it true you did this? And once they got into that pattern, that's why the case got out of control and three young men were arrested and Three families were literally destroyed. You talk about them ripping the house apart. And one of the details that I recall is these devastated parents finally get to go home. And the mother is looking for clothes. First of all, she can't bury her daughter in her favorite dress because that's been destroyed. But they look for their things and they say everything from their closet, their bedroom closet, has been dumped in the swimming pool. Little details like that, you say, how does this happen? You use that example of slowly breaking him down psychologically, convincing him that he has this dual personality, that he doesn't remember what happened when he was asleep. And by telling him outright lies, like, well, we found blood in your room. How did it get there? And he says, well, what, what? Well, you know how, all of that. This seems like it would be a CBS late movie in the old days where <laughs> those weren't the top writers, the A-list people writing in prime time. And you'd say, oh, well, that can never happen. It happens. It happens right here. And I guess the most important thing that you would tell listeners is, well, get legal counsel, have somebody there with you to represent you, to protect your rights. But that often sounds very self-serving from an attorney like yourself. So I'll say it. Gosh, get a lawyer. You <laughs> Protect yourself. But the thing is, not all lawyers are created equal. Like the old joke, what do you call the guy who's last in his medical school class? Doctor, right? <laughs> <They're>, <laughs> it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to recognize it. They may not recognize this read technique. That sounds a little bit like it could be a, a massage. People may not even have that stick in their head when they need the information. You talk about that in She's So Cold. And I wondered if listeners and if your readers can be confident that lawyers will be familiar with it. Would there have been places, as you read those transcripts that are in She So Cold, where any lawyer would have said, well, hey, wait a minute, these are leading, badgering questions. I'm going to stop this interrogation right now. You've hit the nail on the head. Not all lawyers should be advising their clients in regards to a criminal matter, much less a police investigation. And normally the family reaches out to the person that did the family trust or will or handled an automobile accident for them. The bottom line to it is you want somebody that has handled criminal law. And once you've handled criminal law and dealt with the state and the power of the state 
exercised through the police and through the district attorney and prosecuting attorneys of the state, then you know when to shut it down, when to protect your client, and not allow them to continue to interrogate. But until you've had that experience, you really could do more harm than good when trying to uh, advise your client if you don't have that background. I thought that too. People often, well, I have a friend who did a little bit of pre-law and we all think about those lawyer bills. We think about things that are really not germane in this moment. You certainly don't think what the worst case scenario could be. You write this in, she's so called. You say the parents initially encouraged their sons to speak to police because they trusted the system. That rule of law, as I said, it's something we take for granted. It's very easy to. It's just like with doctors and, say, opioid addiction. You know, you're sitting there in pain. Somebody's got a white jacket on. They offer you some pills. You're going to take them, and you're not going to necessarily administer them the right way. For instance, when I was in veterinary medicine, people would have gotten a prescription, give Muffin all of these pills, right? Ten days, two pills a day, (laughs) and then they'd come back a few months later and say, well, I have some pills from last time. And you'd say, no, you were supposed to give all of those pills. You shouldn't have any pills left. (laughs) People would say, why do they treat their animals this way? And I would say, look how they treat their own kids or how they treat themselves. Like, we're all busy. Life gets in the way. You you make mistakes. So we can't expect them to treat Muffin exactly as we tell them to. And there's a margin for error. So here we go. This happens here. Well, okay, go in. You didn't do anything wrong. I was reminded of Ronald Reagan's Trust But Verify, which is a little bit anachronistic in 1998, but it made me think of that, of how we keep our guards up as citizens who want to trust these systems. Just how close did these three young men come to slipping through that final crack and ending up in prison for the rest of their lives? Yeah, the the charges that they had against them meant that because they were a juvenile, uh, they could not be executed, but they could be sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. So how close did they come? Oh, very close. The first of the three boys to be tried was Joshua Treadway. He's the one that gave the confession. And after that would have been Michael, and then after that would have been Aaron. If Joshua Treadway had been convicted, they would have given him an option to turn state evidence and avoid prison. That means he would affirm his conviction and say everything that he said in his statement, the confession, was true. So the bottom line to it is, once you have a confession, people don't understand that confessions are made day in and day out by people that are not guilty. But the power of a confession goes back into history, all the way back to the biblical times where they had to have a confession either by torture or otherwise, before the person could be executed or disciplined. So the bottom line to it is the chances after Joshua being convicted was very slim to get an acquittal for the boys remaining. They would have used all of that against him, and that's what they attempt throughout She's So Cold, as you recount it. You write in the book, quote, Many of us think that when someone confesses, they simply must be guilty. That sounds very logical. That rings very true to me. And I wondered just how common are false confessions. And I thought of, of all things, to bring it home to people, Paradise by the Dashboard Light by Meatloaf. He's being badgered there in the front seat. Say say you'll stay with me forever. Say you'll stay with me till the end of time. And finally, he just blurts out, okay, I started swearing on my life, God, and on my mother's grave that I'll love you till the end of time. And that's a simple confession. That's a confession that anybody might make in the wee hours being badgered into it. How common are they in the legal system when somebody's being badgered? It is estimated of the 2 million men and women that are incarcerated, 50,000 of them have given a false confession. That does not include those people who have pled guilty. The innocent projects that exist normally do not take a case where an inmate pled guilty. And that's because they're so hard to undo the plea. So what you have is an estimate of 50,000 out of 2 million. The significance that one has to understand is that 
between 35 to 48 percent of those false confessions are by children under 18. That is why in my book, I have Miranda warnings that are geared specifically to the youthful offender. And the reason is they just don't understand the Miranda rights. It is a developmental question. It's one that they have to be taught. They cannot understand it just by the words themselves. More importantly, they don't understand the consequences that occur when they waive their rights. So the Miranda rights for the children that are proposed in the book are important so that they get simpler language and warnings about what they are being advised to give up. The second thing is the Bill of Rights that's also proposed for children in the book. And there, adults step in and protect the child. So the bottom line to it is, it is a staggering amount of people that go to jail because they are coerced into a confession or somehow because of the consequences of being executed or going to jail for life, they take a plea bargain and get a lesser sentence because they don't want to risk the consequences. You have that right on the cover of She So-Called includes new Miranda rights for children. And it's something very important in this case. It comes across as you're reading it. We're a reader. You're outside the book. But this really sucks you in. And you say early in the book that readers may need to put it down from time to time just because it's very overwhelming. And I'll be honest, I read that and I thought, well, you know, I read books all the time. It can't be as bad as books on some horrible genocide or murders in war, deaths in war. But man, it really was. You put it aside and you say, if, what if that was me? What if that was my kid? You said about them not understanding the right to remain silent. Have you ever tried to keep a 14-year-old, a 13-year-old, a 15-year-old quiet? I mean, we all remember being that age. But I want to tell you my side. I want to tell you, but that's not fair. What he said is wrong. We all do those things. And you don't understand the power yet of just saying nothing. As an attorney, you learned that throughout your training, right? Don't say more than you need to. You don't need to gild the lily. You don't need to do what comics call a shaggy dog story where you tell the joke and you can add and you really want to keep the stem winder winding. You don't want to do that if you're that age. And yet when you're being made to talk for hours and hours, twice in fact, two different days, police interrogated your client for over 11 hours straight and keep asking those questions. That's about the time that it takes to drive from New York to Chicago. Now, if you drove somebody just in the car that long, they'd probably be exhausted and willing to tell you whatever you wanted to hear. That's just how it is. And when you're that age, we treat kids like they're just already mini adults, right? We do it. It seems like it's a year earlier every year. And when you're dealing with the legal system, it's not a good idea to have somebody just sit there and is going to say things, maybe say something mad, especially at that age. You'll, you'll just say something just to get somebody off your back. You'll say it just to stick it to them. And that comes across in these transcripts that it's really uneven. Not only do you have authority figures and not only do you have people who are doctors, people who are administering things like the lie detector test, but they're people that are older and you want them to know better. Even if this had happened, there, there has to be that open mind. And that seems to never happen on the part of the detectives and those prosecuting the case. Well, what we teach our children is the police protect them. And so there is a natural phenomenon uh, where the child wants to talk to the police. But more importantly, think of yourself as a adolescent or an uh, older child. This is an adult world. Adults tell you what to do all the time, whether it's in school or your parents or on the street. Adults are always telling you what to do. There's an interesting survey, uh, actually research, conducted by some neuroscientists and psychologists where they asked the adolescents what they thought the right to remain silent meant. And their response was almost consistently that it meant shut up, don't say anything, just answer the questions when asked. Huh. You've got to look at 
the mind and the development of the mind at that age. It is in such flux. It is one of the reasons why children do impetuous things. There are some very brilliant kids out there that do some very stupid things, and that's because the frontal lobe of their brains has not fully developed, nor has the intellectual part of the brain been connected to the frontal lobe, meaning that section of the brain where they learn things is not connected to the impulse, and therefore they will say and agree to anything just to go home. It is a staggering event to watch a child being interrogated. They are defenseless. And in this case, the idea of children being not developed plays against two of these boys. Michael Crow, they say, well, he's a clever kid. He could have planned this. Somebody must have planned it because we can't find any clues. That's that backwards thinking that I mentioned. We have our verdict already. We've convicted this kid in our minds, but we can't find any clues. So how can we change our observation to fit our preconceived notion? And the same goes for your client, Aaron Hauser. If there's a hero in She's So Cold, it's him as I'm reading it because he is smart. The police don't quite back off, but they go through some twists and turns there to try to avoid tipping him off, so to speak, and have his suspicions aroused. For instance, they bury his Miranda warnings in a longer document that they ask him to sign during one of these marathon sessions. You write in She's So Cold, quote, While it's true that prospective clients scrutinize the attorneys they are thinking of hiring, good attorneys also analyze each prospective new client. Now, I mentioned plugging those cracks, and you threw yourself into one of those cracks, whether you knew you were or not, to stop this cascade of injustice from coming down. When you were extremely cautious, as you put it, when you were even skeptical the day you met the Housers, what was it that convinced you to sign on for this case? Did something tip you off in those? I guess it would just be a few brief minutes that somebody calls you and says, hey, we have this case. How did you end up being the attorney for the Housers? Well, the Housers originally contacted me because the district attorney, Paul Finks of uh, San Diego County, wanted them to come in and meet with him. And so they were smart enough to come to me. And I agreed to go with them and meet with Paul Finks. Of course, when we showed up and I was there with them, the deputy DAs that were there asking why I was accompanying them, I'm not here to ask a thousand and one questions. I'm here to observe and protect my clients. So Paul Finks asked us to go into his very spacious and uh, <laughs> intimidating office. And we walked in, and you wouldn't believe what he unloaded upon the Housers. He told the father and the mother that because of the boy's mental state, he asked their help in convincing Aaron Hauser, their son, mm. to confess. Yeah, he told them your son's a psychopathic killer, right? That you should be fearful that he might harm you in some way. Well, that's when I knew that the DA didn't have all of the evidence necessary to convict my client. And that's why I took the case. I also took the case for another reason. I was doing some remodeling in my home, and I have a theater where a screen drops down, and I was projecting the interview, the actual recorded video interviews on the screen. And I was watching the interview of Michael, and I was grossly involved in what was happening because it was very dramatic. And then I heard this whimper behind me, and I turned around, and there were the three construction men, grown men, standing there. One was actually crying. Another one had a clenched fist. The other one said out loud, my God, that could be my boy. That's when I knew I had a case I could defend, and the secret was in those interrogation tapes. And that's why the book, She's So Cold, takes those video transcripts, line for line, word for word, and I let the reader read what the boys went through and what the police said to them. And I let them decide if the police were wrong, overstepped, and bullied these kids into confessions and statements that could be used against them. 
you're enjoying my conversation with attorney Donald E. McGinnis, author of the true crime book, She's So Cold, Murder, Accusations, and the System That Devastated a Family. You can find our guest online at donaldmcginnis.com or like the Hamilton and McGinnis Facebook page. Crime Traveler's Fiona Guy describes She's So Cold as, quote, an eye-opening and shocking insight into the inner workings of a complex case. And she goes on to say, The horrid truth behind the case is that justice has not been achieved for Stephanie Crow, a young girl inside her own home who suffered what must have been a terrifying and painful death. You write at points throughout She's So Cold that readers may have to put down the book, but there are also inspiring moments. For instance, people who don't even know the Crows, the Housers, or the Treadways put up their homes for collateral to raise money for their defense. Boy, I think in these cynical times, you wouldn't believe that strangers would would risk something so precious as their home for people that they didn't even know, even for people that they know, never mind people that they don't know at all and believe in them. Now you're talking about these construction workers behind you that are moved to tears. I can't imagine the video. I read the transcripts and I I was really moved by them and frustrated and, and angry at the injustice and the badgering that these boys suffer. What did that sort of buy-in from strangers mean to the attorneys working to exonerate these young men? And in this case, it really is exoneration. You know, get them freed first, but eventually you want to work towards finding who the actual killer is. Remember, there were four police officers, three from the Escondido Police Department, one from the Oceanside Police Department, a police psychologist, and a deputy district attorney, Deputy DA Hoover who was there telling them what to do and how to structure the case. And that's one of the failings of any police department is when the DA steps in and becomes an active participant in the actual investigation. The DA is supposed to be the civil authority, the one that goes to college and law school, the one that has the power to issue complaints and only issues complaints when they think justice will be done not only for the victim, but justice will be will not uh, be sacrificed against a wrongly accused person. So the bottom line to it is the whole system broke down in this case, and that comes out in the book. The reason that the community rallied for these boys is I had Aaron, I took Aaron and his mother, who was an elementary school teacher, And I let them see, I let the the mother see the interrogations. And then I let other people in the community that were close friends also see the interrogations. And they became incensed. And I called it Aaron's Army. It was 50 people who rallied to the support of the Hauser family. And once that was done, I then involved uh, the Treadway family, Josh Treadway, the other boy, and then, of course, the Crow family. And all of these people became part of the supporting community for the defense of these kids. And that's why we were able to, when time came, they were furious because they sat through what's called a Welfare and Institution 707 hearing. And that's a hearing where a judge and the DA and the defense put all the evidence on and the judge decides whether or not the child will stay in the juvenile system and be reformed or go to adult court, superior court, where he can be sent to prison for life. The whole community, all those 50 people showed up for court every day and they saw the evidence and they heard it. And after the judge spoke from the bench at the in that 707 hearing that if she was the trier of fact, she would acquit the boys, and she then released the boys on their own recognizance to go home, Deputy DA Summer Steffens ran downstairs to the adult court, filed a complaint, which he already had prepared, 
and ask the judge to set a half a million dollars bail for each child. Once the community found out about that, they went berserk. And that's why they stepped forward and put their homes up, put their retirement funds up to get those boys out of jail. I can't imagine doing that. And I like to think of myself as a a good person. So I can imagine moving 50 people to do that. Imagine how compelling that evidence was to see it. It's really something that had to push you to make such an extraordinary commitment to it. And as listeners hear you describing the case in She So Called, I want them to know that this is not just you doing your job as a defense attorney. It's clear. It's a fact. It's incontrovertible that the boys are innocent. In fact, the court took the extraordinary step of declaring them innocent. Usually we get guilty, not guilty in a court. And that's how our court's designed, right? They don't exonerate. We just went through Robert Mueller's testimony in the Russia collusion hearings and explaining that that's not what we do. You're not here to exonerate, right? That's not the role of a prosecutor. So this is what happens here in this case. The only similar example I can recall as a layman is that of silent film star Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle. He was also falsely accused of murder and he was exonerated. The jury gave him an apology. The judge did, but he went through a terrible trial, literal and figurative. It was really a trying time for him. So explain what that meant to your clients and to you also as an attorney, as somebody who fought this lonely fight in the beginning and then drove through all these extra efforts and had to suffer through all that video, all that watching. You really lived with this for a while. Explain what that meant to them and to you to have at least this small way, nothing could ever totally right the wrong and make right what they went through, but explain what that meant to them that the state, at least in some way, was able to try to make right what they did to them. Well, these are 14 and 15-year-old boys by the time we got into the 707 hearing, and they didn't know what was going on. All they knew was that the adults were fighting over them and that the DA, Summer Seffens, Deputy DA Summer Seffens, was calling them every name under the sun. Killers, psychopaths, you name it, she called them. When she would go outside during recesses, she would give the kids dirty looks to the point where Cheryl Crow would cry, seeing the vicious looks that this prosecutor was giving to her son. So they didn't know really what was going on. And there's a photograph in the newspapers of my escorting out Aaron Hauser from the 707 hearing after the judge said, I'm releasing the boys on their own recognizance to go home now. And she also said that she, by law, had to refer them to adult court because there was circumstantial evidence that implied that they were involved due to the confessions in the murder of Stephanie. So though she released them to go home, though she said if she was the trier of fact, she would find them not guilty of the charges, she had to refer them back up to adult court. So the boys didn't understand what was going on. They were totally confused. And the public, of course, was joyous. I mean, It's hard to describe this unless you've been in court when a judge does such a thing as saying the boys are innocent and releasing them. The gallery of 50 people were yelling, applauding, standing up. But I knew that that battle was just beginning because we had to relitigate everything in adult court and the boys would be tried separately in adult court. So it was a very joyous time and a very disappointing one, especially when the DA ran downstairs, filed the complaint, and within 45 minutes had the bail revoked so that the kids had to go back into jail. I had their bail reinstated. I mean, not the bail revoked, but had bail reposted against them and the OR was revoked. You write early in She So Called that Detective Ralph Clayton could not have guessed that this case would haunt him forever and that it would be his last homicide investigation. We talked about the people's side, the prosecution, but 
how do you hope readers will view the police in this case and their role in this cascade of terrible events, terrible choices that they made, this putting the verdict first and the investigation afterwards and hammering the facts in to meet what their preconceived bias was against Michael Crow and then his two friends. What happens to them? What what do you want people to think? Who do we trust or how do we make sure that the system is helping us that eventually, hopefully, we get to somebody along the line, hopefully not as late as a judge or as late as a jury, who sees it if we are innocent of something we're being accused of just because we were in the house and the police don't have any other suspects? Well, I wrote the book and I tried not to preach. I tried not to expose my feelings. I tried not to comment upon the actions of the police. I tried to do it in a way where I used the transcripts and let the transcripts tell the story of what the police were doing and why they were doing it. It is up to the reader to decide about these men. I I am biased. I lived through it. Uh, it was one of the worst cases I ever had to handle. But I try not to preach in the book. I let the facts tell the story. And by the way, there's one more thing. There is a finding of not guilty, and then there is a finding which was done by a judge, Judge So, that the boys were factually innocent, which means, and this is extraordinarily rare, it is extraordinarily rare, that that finding occurred a couple of years later after the vagrant was tried and convicted. That means that a judge has reviewed the entire evidence, has listened to the district attorney, has listened to the defense, and makes a finding that the three boys were factually innocent and had nothing to do with the death of Stephanie Crow. I have seen that only once in my life prior to this. It is an extraordinary finding by a judge. Again and again, the police declare, in your words, case closed. And that also made me think at the time as I read it, their minds are closed as well. That's not what an investigator is supposed to be doing. Anybody who's watched even, and I'm sure this is terrible for you to hear as an attorney, anybody who's even watched one of those CBS late night Columbo movies or watched <laughs> Law & Order, they should know that it's almost never the person that Jessica Fletcher in Murder, She Wrote thinks it is in the first scene. And yet they close their minds and go down that road. And you would still hope that despite reading these transcripts and seeing it, you would hope that they do, readers, when they read it, realize that, hey, these police had to see that little girl on the floor of her bedroom stabbed and murdered too, and they wanted somebody brought to justice for it. The thing is, that's the sort of justice, in quotes, that you get from a lynch mob or that you expect from a lynch mob where they grab the closest person. For police, you hope that we train them to realize that they can't do that, that sometimes when you hear hoofbeats as we say in veterinary medicine, and a lot of people use this quote, but sometimes they are zebras and not horses. But when we hear hoofbeats, we think of horses and we don't think of the zebras. So we've talked a lot about that, about the wrongfully accused side of the Crow murder case. But what about flipping the script? How can we train police better to keep an open mind? If there's law enforcement listening right now and they're thinking, hey, if that was me, I might have made the same exact assumption because there's no other sign there in that house because Michael Crow, they see, in their opinion, he doesn't seem to be too broken up. He goes and he's playing video games after they find his sister dead not long after, and they think, well, that that's just that just has to be there's something broken about this kid. What do you hope that they will do or that we as people will do who have police in our communities to better be able to put on that badge and keep that lynch mob mentality out of their heads and keep an open mind. Try to think, hey, maybe there's some other criminals somewhere out there, because in this case, there definitely was the man who actually did it. You've got to understand the mentality of how police officers are trained. Having been a deputy DA in two different counties, I intimately was exposed to that. And they follow what's called the accusatory system. That is what the American justice system is based upon. They get a suspect, they assume the suspect is guilty, and they follow the read technique of interrogation. 
my book has a chapter on that where I explain in detail what the read technique is. And it's a psychological form of manipulation that even adults cannot withstand. So they are always going to get their man. They are always going to get their confession. Now, once Abu Grade and the 911 interrogations and taking suspects and putting them overseas in military and foreign compounds, once that occurred, once Obama came in as president, a, he formed what was called HIG, H-I-G. And the HIG system is a high-value form of interrogation. And the HIG system was formed to find other methods to interrogate people and to investigate a case without falling into the trap that the Reed technique of interrogation can lead you to. So HIG is the High Value Detainee Interrogation Group, H-I-G. And they have done extensive research and have looked at all different systems of interrogation, including one that was started in Great Britain. It's called PEACE, P-E-A-C. And the PEACE form of interrogation is completely different from the Reed form of interrogation. PEACE does not assume that person that they are interviewing is guilty or is part of a conspiracy. And they do not lie about the evidence saying your co-conspirator has already confessed and implicated you or the evidence we have collected proves that you did the burglary or you killed the person. They are not allowed to lie. They assume that the person they talk to is innocent and they use what is called cognitive intelligence interrogation. And that method is they ask questions and they're not closed questions, they're open-ended questions. And they allow the suspect to explain himself. And then if they see contradictions between what the suspect says and what physical evidence they do have, they can ask questions about that. The Canadians use the same method of interrogation. They have tried to drop and for the most part have discontinued use of the read form of interrogation. But in the United States, almost all police departments, federal, state, and city, use the read technique of interrogation. So I would say to those police officers out there that are listening, look at other forms of investigating a case. Look at other ways to do it. Look at other forms of interrogation. There are other ways of getting justice done and getting people convicted. In fact, in a study, it was found that the peace system of interrogation using cognitive interrogation produced less, less false confessions than the read technique. So there are other ways out there to conduct a case. Now, the downside to the peace form or cognitive interrogation form of investigation is it takes longer. And police are always in a hurry to close the case and move on. There's another thing that comes up as you're talking there about the read technique, and that's they use voice analysis on the boys and the lie detector, which I guess it would be to them in a layman's term. As somebody who has a science background, I never trust them. I don't like the use of anything like that. You have the transcript here of the technician, the man administering the test in She So Cold. Do they have any place? Why do we keep using them if they are subjective, especially when, as in this case, it's used to get some kind of rise out of a suspect and then say, oh, aha, we have you. See here, it says you're lying. I mean, it might as well it might as well just be hooking them up to a toaster and saying, well, the toast came out really dark. That <laughs> means you're lying. What, what place does that have in our criminal justice system? Well, the police are allowed to lie. That's the bottom line. The police are allowed to lie. And many police departments will use a lie detector, or in this case, what is called a computer voice stress analyzer, CVSA test. 
And uh, supposedly, if you lie, there is an inflection that is detected by the machine that shows that you are not being truthful. Or in a lie detector test, your sweat, your heart rate, whatever the indicators are, will flash up and show that you're not telling the truth. But many police departments take these tests and abuse them. They say, you failed. Look at the test results. Look at the printout. And, of course, the person that is the suspect doesn't know how to read any printout from a CVSA test or even a lie detector test. And as a consequence, they believe that somehow the evidence is beyond doubt that they have the evidence and they're going to be convicted and they confess. So the bottom line to it is the police are allowed to lie and the courts feel that that's fair game because suspects lie all the time. But not every suspect is always lying as is the case here and she's so cold. They just can't be believed. That's why I said that Kafka-esque idea of them being in there. You really feel for them because You know the police don't know what they're saying that they know. It doesn't mean we want to see a murderer go free, but I think there's a sense of the unfairness of it. And that's why I think the lie detector bugs me, because I say that that could be anything. And as you said, showing somebody a readout with a bunch of squiggles on it from an EKG, it could be anything. And it's it's not even admissible. Is it? Is it admissible in a court? No, it's not admissible. Yeah, so what's the point? But that confession (laughs) that it produces is surely admissible. Yeah. Now, there's one more point that uh, really should be made. The police made several mistakes. The first mistake was, since they had no evidence, they went on their gut assumption that somebody in the house had committed the crime. The second thing is, these detectives felt that they had an ability to sense when a person is lying and when they are not. And they assumed that Michael was a suspect and that he was lying to them. Now, the read technique of interrogation, the primary criticism against that system is that it relies upon the police officer to determine when the suspect that is being interviewed is lying. So once they got into that accusatory interrogation, they One step after another led to one conclusion that the boys were guilty, and then because the prosecutor was intimately involved in in the case, they didn't back down. They didn't criticize what the cops had done. They proceeded ahead to try the boys and get a conviction at any cost. Just can't imagine what they went through. It's here in She So Called. A lot of details that will just jump out at readers, a lot of terrible things. It's not just having questions asked. It's horrible enough to have young Stephanie Crow die, but then to be dragged down to the station, stripped, have photos taken of your naked body, things like this, and not be allowed to bury your daughter, not be allowed to grieve. I'd like to ask you to make your closing argument, I guess we'll call it. Why should listeners, if maybe they think they live in a nice town, this is something that happens to other people, pick up She So Called and experience this cautionary tale of justice denied for the Crow family? Well, everybody is familiar with the Central Park Five, five boys, minorities, that the police use the same techniques against to get them to confess to their crimes, supposedly the crimes that they committed against that jogger that was raped and brutalized. What is significant about the Crow case is that these families were middle-class, law-abiding families. The boys were good students, outstanding students in school with no prior criminal record. They were not out in a park looking for thrills and to get into trouble as the Central Park Five were. These three boys, these three families could be any of us, any of us, not because they were white, but because they were middle-class, law-abiding, and did nothing wrong but try to cooperate with the police. That's why they should read this book. It could happen to anybody. 
middle class family, a good family, really liked by the neighborhood that comes through. A Christian family, again and again, the, the boys are thinking, well, gosh, how's God letting this happen to me? She's so cold, held my interest from the first page to the last. I just want to hammer it home one last time that runaway prosecution, you could be caught up with this. You don't know when someone's going to come drifting through your town and do something. Hopefully not something as brutal as a murder. It could be theft. It could be any number of things. So this book, so glad that it was sent to me. I really did enjoy it, if enjoying is the right word because I feel smart and I feel armed against what could possibly happen. I want to thank you so much, Donald McGinnis, for taking the time to discuss the Crow murder case. And if I have any standing to just thank you for the overall cause of justice and for taking the time to write this book. You you didn't have to do that, and you did. For that, I thank you. I wish you the best of luck with it. And thanks again for letting me play a small part here in hopefully making that more perfect union and giving us a better system of justice. Well, thank you very much, Dean. Again, the book is She's So Cold. Murder, Accusations, and the System That Devastated a Family. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at historyauthor.com on the page for this episode. By buying the book through us, you help keep the flux capacitor on our time machine humming like usual. I really have to give special thanks to Donald E. McGinnis, not just for joining us, but for taking the time to write this book, to share this true crime travesty in the 90s that's relevant to all of us today. Who knows who might pick up this book, like any good history book, and have their life changed by it. It's really terrifying what these three young men and the whole Crow family went through. You can find our guest online at donaldmcginnis.com. Again, that last name is M-C-I-N-N-I-S. And you can like his Hamilton and McGinnis page on Facebook. While you're at it, you can let us know what you think of the book and the interview on Twitter at History Dean. Instagram at the History Author Show or Facebook.com slash History Author. That's it for this true crime installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for our next all new interview right here on iHeartRadio or enjoy one of the written QA interviews we post at HistoryAuthor.com every now and then. And if you're an iTunes subscriber, please take a minute to leave us a review. Well, until our next trip into the past together, thanks so much for time traveling with us today, and have a great week. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore.